He's fun. He's goofy. He is a goofball. <laughs> he's straight up, he's a goofball. He is, there's a reason he's one of my best friends in the entire world. He is a blast to be around. He, uh, there's no reason a 30-year-old should be hanging out with a 71-year-old with a man. That dude is a good time. I, I pick him over. Anybody else is so much fun to hang out with. He's a blast. Have you been around a pastor who has been sucking on a sour lemon? Nearly his whole dad gum life, and all he can think about is what you're not doing? That guy is about as much fun to hang around as I, I don't even know. I might give you an example. That's not fun. You can tell God is faithful. What, what is going on? The blessing and favor of the Lord is upon our, our pastor, our apostle. He's fun to be around. He's been in the presence of the Lord. When you're around him, there are nuggets that are coming from heaven. I, felt, I nearly felt bad for these kids that came over this, this last week. It feels like a week and a day, didn't it? Who came over yesterday. It was like drinking from a fire hose from a forum. You know, they come, they come walking up, and they're not ready for the deposits that are coming down. It's like every God story God wants to share with them. And so they're walking up, and they're going, hey, and they're expecting old, old crazy guy. And what are they getting? Come with me, son. Why don't you hop in the chair? Why don't you hop, I mean, the truck with me? Why don't you hop in the truck with me, and let's go take a ride? And as they're taking a ride to go do some work, the layers of their heart are being peeled back. And God is speaking and ushering things in. That's what it's like to walk with the Lord. That's what it's like to be one of his shepherds. That's how he deals with us. So when he's, when he's walking in favor and in intimacy with one of his shepherds, they are overflowing with life and love. And you have spiritual nuggets and you're pouring out. And you have people who want to be around you. You want to be around them. And there's koinonia and love. And it's, it's something else. And when you're walking with a shepherd who's been sucking on a sour lemon for a long time, what does he have? A wide berth. <laughs> you don't want to be around that home skillet. You don't want to be around him. Because if you come into his vicinity, he's kind of judgmental. And he's got some things that you need to be doing. And your life isn't measuring up. And neither is his. And it's really, he's just frustrated with himself and the things that God's not doing. God is faithful. God is faithful. I'm just saying, no judgment on anyone. You can just tell them from a mile away. God is faithful. So in Zechariah, make sure I'm in the right spot and I am not. In Zechariah chapter 11, God has a message. Oh, I did it wrong again. God has a message to his shepherds, to some wayward shepherds. God has a people, we've been talking about this for a couple of weeks. God has a people that he loves, that he's pouring himself out upon. He wants to reveal himself to his people. He's invited them into a covenant relationship. And all, all they have to do is just come and be instructed. And they're looking towards the shepherds. And at this time, these shepherds, some of them are wicked. And they are doing some rotten things, and he has to deal with them. Now here up front, Grace Fellowship, from me... 99.99999% of the time, you're going to get 9999. We'll keep going. 999% of the time, I'm a carrot man. Oh, I'm going to talk to you guys about the promises of God, all the good, the blessing to come. And I, I love it when God lays out, you know, the red carpet. And he says, it's almost like he loses sometimes. Do you want life and love and liberty? Come my way. Drink your fill. You want freedom and hope and a future. Come my way. Drink your fill. But he has another side. He has a stick side as well. It's where it's, it's the perfect place that Jesus sits in. It's where it's the mercy seat. It's where love and justice meet. It's where if you don't and you operate in your own in self, in your own desires and, and partnership with the demonic ways, you will suffer the consequences. And there is a stick, there's a way, there's a natural order of things that is not designed like this. And if you hurt his sheep, those ones, remember, he's sending out of himself, he's sending out, in our day, he sends out his spirit. And they are hungry and enlivened and they would come running towards him. And if you squash these little ones, it is better that a millstone be tied around your neck and you be cast into the sea. Jesus' words himself. 
He's got to stick to it. Zechariah chapter 11. So remember, Grace Fellowship, 99.99% of the time, I'm with the Lord on this one. I love the carrot. He invites you into something wonderful. Shepherds, 0.1. Here we go. This is a stick today. Open your doors, O Lebanon, that the fire may devour your cedars. Wail, O Cyprus, for the cedars have fallen, for the glorious trees are ruined. Wail! Can you hear? He's not saying, wail. Lament. Yeah. Lebanon! He's talking to him. Your cedar has fallen for the glorious trees. They're ruined. Wail. Feel this. Oaks of Bashan, for the thick forest has been felled. The sound of the wail of the shepherds, for their glory is ruined. The sound of the roar of the lions, for the thicket of Jordan is ruined. Thus says the Lord God. And here he comes. He's getting ready to say something. And here's full disclosure on prophetic language. It gets messy. I can't tell you with any certainty that, that Zechariah lived this out like Hosea did. Hosea, if you're unfamiliar, Hosea was a prophet in his time. And God told him, hey, my people, they have been prostituting themselves out. And they have turned to other gods. And they will not follow me no matter what. And I want to be their husband. But they don't want to be my people. And so here's what you're going to do. You're going to go find a prostitute, and you're going to marry her. And then y'all are going to have kids, and I want you to name those kids. I want nothing to do with you, and I shouldn't have had you, or something. You know, I can't remember the exact name. <laughs> but they were bad. They were real bad. And he actually had to live that out with his wife running off on him so often. He had to go, uh, go and get his wayward wife that he got into that relationship because God said in the first place, what a miserable deal. And I don't know if Zachariah is actually living this out, but I would guess, if you'll accept a little... <clears throat> guessing from your pastor I think this is more prophetic language descriptive of our Messiah and I think he's prophesying both into the future and into the past did you know God could do such a thing I knew he could do the future I didn't know he did the past too check this out thus says the Lord my God become a shepherd of the flock doomed to slaughter amen that's a good job those who buy them slaughter them and go unpunished. And those who sell them say, Blessed be the Lord. Blessed be the Lord. I have rich, I have become rich. This is where, was this you? We say that. Hey, I'm in this, I'm in this passage. I have become rich. I've become rich. And our own shepherds have no pity on them. For I will no longer have pity on the inhabitants of this land, declares the Lord. Behold, I will cause each of them to fall into the hand of his neighbor and each into the hand of his king, and they shall crush the land. And I will deliver, deliver them, deliver none of them, and I will deliver none from their hand. So I became the shepherd of the flock, doomed to be slaughtered by the sheep traders. And I took two staffs, and one of them I named Favor. The other I named Union. Shepherds have staffs. I'm going to build me a staff. Shepherds have staff. And I tended the sheep. And in one month, and in one month, I destroyed the three shepherds. But I became impatient with them, and they also detested me. So I said, I won't be your shepherd. What's to die, let it die. What is to be destroyed, let it be destroyed. And let those who are left devour the flesh of one another. And I took my staff called favor, and I broke it. And I annulled the covenant that I had made with all the people. Uh-oh. An eternal, unfailing God who is for his people, so frustrated, that he takes the staff of favor, breaks it, and annuls that favor? Okay. Nobody's in on that one. And I took my staff of favor, and I broke it, annulling the covenant that I had made with all the peoples. So it was annulled on that day. And the sheep traders, the ones who were looking on, the world that was looking on, looked at this, looked at this act, and they knew that was from the Lord. And I said to them, if it, seems, if it seems good to you, give me my wages. But if not, keep them. And they weighed out my wages, which were 30 pieces of silver. Does that sound familiar to anyone? 
that the life would be counted, that the sacrifice would be counted, that the, that the offering would be counted at 30 pieces of silver. Then the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter. Does the potter sound familiar? The potter in this is probably a reference to a storehouse, to a treasury, to a place that you, you do that sort of thing. But uh, he's going to go on and describe a little bit more. The lordly price at which I was priced by them. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and I threw them into the house of the Lord, the potter. Does that sound familiar? Does anyone resonate with Judas? Uh, some of you, if you're not uh, Bible scholars, this is exactly the occurrence of what's going on. Jesus was betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. The, the, the silver was cast out before, whenever he went, when Judas went back to return the money and say, I don't want that money, I've done a bad thing. He scatters it out before the priest of the Lord. And there is a field that is bought with that money. It's the potter's field. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw it back in the house of the Lord to the potter. Then I broke my second staff called union, annulling the brotherhood between Judah and Israel. And on this, the only thing that we know of, unless there is a future event where Israel and Judah are restored and the people are, restored and the people are reconciled and inhabit those lands, unless there's a future to that, that has probably already happened. Even in Zechariah's day. So what you're looking at is God prophesying before, like foreknowledge. He's talking about Jesus, his coming, his betrayal, the good shepherd. And he's also looking back and he's talking about the two lands that have caught, that he's, he's had divorce. And there's a separation between the two. Our God is amazing. That's why I say prophetic language gets a little weird in all this stuff. He's going forwards and backwards. But what that should mean to us shepherds is something insanely good. Our God is so amazing that when he says something, it is eternal. It has a forward end, it has a backwards end. There are some of the best words I've noticed in my life. They have been true of my past and they will be true of my future. At least they are up into this day. They will be true of my future eternally. When God says something, he just lets it ripple and echo throughout the ages. That's our God. <laughs> then the Lord said to me, take once more the equipment of the foolish shepherd. And here's where I want us to learn, good shepherds. Here's where I want us to learn how to move forward. He's going to give us an illustration of a bad shepherd. And it tells us a lot about what's on his heart for his people and how he wants us to love on his people, to receive from him and to love on his people well. He says, take, take once more the equipment of the foolish shepherd. And here it goes. For behold, I am raising up in the land a shepherd who does not care for those being destroyed. And <laughs> we got to do that. I'm raising up a shepherd who doesn't care. Apparently he does. A shepherd who does not care for those being destroyed. Have a heart for those who are being crushed because God does. What am I talking about? Oh, I don't know. Let's pick one example. Have a heart for the unborn who are being crushed and destroyed. At least have some sympathy for the voices who do not have a voice. Stand. When someone asks you have an opinion, don't shrink away. Yes. I stand for the ones who don't have, the ones who are being crushed and oppressed. Because you're a good shepherd. Because of the good shepherd. He has an opinion about these things. It is his heart. Who does not care for those being young? Or seek the young. Or heal the maimed. Who seek out the young ones who are in need of instruction. Or heal the maimed. I love that. That is going on in our young, our young adults. What are these? These are extreme young adults if they're young adults. <laughs> these wee ones. <laughs> it is on the heart of Felix and Jonah that they would get the full measure. They don't have a junior Holy Spirit, so they have full Holy Spirit activated inside of a little, little vessel that has no restraint. And sometimes that's amazing, and sometimes that needs to be shepherded a little bit. But I, I bless their heart because they want to heal the maid. They want to see what God can do. The little ones. Grace Fellowship, I don't need to say this to you, but I will just to charge your hearts because I'm an exhorter. 
Do not silence the little ones. Let them come. If you have an ache, an ailment, something on your body, let them pray and let them see the power of God. If you do not believe for it, fine. But let them. Let them lead us in that. Get the heart of the shepherd on this matter. He's a healer. It's who he is. It is what he does when he works upon this earth. Let him do his thing. If we have faith for it, let's run after the heal, after the ones who need healing. If we don't, let the little ones do it. Let them do it and knock down mountains, kill giants for us. If you're like me, uh, Jason was, <laughs> we were praying over his son. I think it was Judah. We were praying over Judah, and uh, the word came that he would be an aggressive receiver. <laughs> and and, and uh, hats off to my friend who, who just loves being on the action. He let the word finish. You know, he let, let, the, let his son get the full download. But then he comes motoring. Y'all remember that? He comes motoring and it's like, hey, and uh, I'm going to leave in this. I'm going to be the regressive receiver. receiver. Then do me next. I want to do that. That's just how God moves, how God works. Let us be like that. If there's someone out there to be, that is in need of healing or has been maimed, let's be the first one whose heart breaks and intercedes and cries out and, and believes for God to do some cool stuff. Nourish the healthy. Well, I believe that's you. You, shepherds, well, I believe that's me. Thank you. Thank you that when you come over to our house, to our land last night, you aren't taking What's in it for me? How come we're not getting any time with the pastor? How come, how come, how come? No, what'd y'all do? You brought hot dogs. You brought s'mores. You brought prayers. You brought anticipation. You brought worship and praise. Thank you. I was at a, I was tired last night. Big boy doesn't work like that very often. I was tired last night. And I was edified. I was nourished. By you. But devours the flesh of the fat ones, tearing off even their hooves. And I need not say that amongst this group right here. Uh, you guys aren't abusing that I know of. If, if you are, let the full conviction of the Holy Spirit fall upon you. If you're tearing apart the little ones, if you're, if you're ripping apart those who are called by God, who are moving closer to his presence, who are, who are excited. Like if y'all showed up last night... And told those kids what they needed to know about religion. And yeah, 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 yeah. Make sure that they tithe to you for 1995. No. <laughs> I need not even say that in here. God has done a truly incredible work. There was a man. To show you where this goes. Kind of the full culmination of it. Some of you have heard this story. Some of you are going to get to hear it again. Pastor David and myself and a handful of others, I think Billy was with us at the time. Billy fought me. We went up with Doug. Maybe I don't think Jim was in town. Jim was probably out of town at that time. We went to go see Doug, and there was a group of guys, and they were figuring out how fathers, father, fathers, father, fathering, fathers. A bunch of fathers. I got lost in fathers. Kind of like the 99.9999 thing. A bunch of fathers going on. A bunch of men who were going to show the next generation how it was done. Okay, some of them probably could have by themselves. But we got there in the room, and there was, a, there was a gentleman who was the lead. I can say it now because enough years have gone by, I believe. He was, he was the head guy in all of Hillsong. Do you guys remember Hillsong back in the day when they were cranking? He was the head of Hillsong uh, on the state side. He had the biggest church and the most impactful ministry, and everybody said, hey, hats off, good, good on you. But he was so stinking arrogant. Oh my gosh, he was swollen up like a tick. He walks in there. Yeah, he's gonna tell, you guys remember Doug, meek and mild and, and pure and innocent. He was gonna tell Doug and his fellow friends who are at the time in their 80s, late 70s, 80s, he's, they're gonna tell them, he's gonna tell them how to be a better father, what kids really need. You always know you're in a good spot when the kids are telling, telling their fathers what they need. Yeah, I need you. This is what fathers really need to be. And for clarification in this conversation, Dave, 
as he likes to do, gets a little crossways. This guy is like my size in the right ways. Maybe a little bit taller, you know what I mean? Like shoulders are huge, arms are swollen, chest is, I mean, he's a big, bit just mentioned, just got done grappling with some folks, does MMA on the side, you know? And he gets into it with Pastor Dave, and Pastor Dave says, wait, 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 wait. I just, I'm just trying to understand you, son. Are you saying, are you, wait, are you threatening me? And the man said, we'll take this outside right now. We're going to make sure I'm getting down. I'm not going to threaten you. And I thought to myself, all the old men in this room, plus me and Billy, it's going to take every last one of us, like, biting his ankles to get this guy down. Dave's a dead man. Dave, dead man walking. Dead man walking. And Dave says this. Dave says, it's just what I needed to know. Thank you, son. Just a heart check. I just want to know, were you threatening me? And he continues on his tirade. That's what I need to know. Thank you. And they go on with the meeting. Dave says, no, 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 we're good. I don't need to step outside. We're fine. Thank you for not stepping outside. <laughs> You're a better man than me. I'm going down with, you know, broken legs and black eyes. Like, call you outside. We're leaving, and he says, it's unfortunate. It's unfortunate. Keep an eye on that man's ministry. There's a way God deals with shepherds who act like that. Two years later, two years. I'm not talking ten, two. Two years later, his marriage is broken, his church has put him under discipline, and he's been, we'll just leave it there. He's been doing things he ought not be doing with the crew around him. God has a way. The beautiful thing that I learned last night, that was a way of dealing with the shepherds. The beautiful things I learned last night, sitting around a campfire with you wonderful people, worshiping the Lord. There's a word that was brought forth. They asked Dave to do it. Dave steps up and he's, he's delivering the, the wisdom from just the distilled, spiritual, hard-earned wisdom that comes from the heavenly realm. And he's, he's letting them have it, these young college kids. And he says something to them. He says, relax. You're not going to get it right. But if your heart is towards Jesus, it doesn't much matter. And I thought to myself, it doesn't much matter. He has a way of working it out. It is a beautiful thing to be corrected by our God. It is a woeful thing to stand at odds against him and treat his sheep poorly. So whether you want, relax. God knows what he's doing. You could not mess this up. You're going to be good shepherds. Your heart is for the king. He's going to show you how to do it. Since when has he said, hey, take care of this area and rolled out? Now he shows you how. You get beat down by the world. He comes under. He lifts you up. He said, now oh, you've been trying real hard. Let me show you how to do it. Let's do it in my strength this time. You ready to go? All right, one, two, three, step. Step. Stay. Here we go. We're pulling. Look at us pulling. You fell down again. Now hold on. Now hold on. Come on. Let's do it. No, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. This, let's go. Step, step, step. Here we go. That's the carrot. And away you go, and he does incredible, miraculous things. And the people of this world are discipled by him. And you are edified by him. And it is so much fun to be a pastor and submission to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But there is a stick where he says, woe to you. And your trees are dried up and the land is dried up and there is division in your house. And wherever you turn, your brother is going to be against you and there will be no rest. Do you want the carrot? Or the stick. And can you imagine? Our apostle says that there is a world. The carrot or the stick. Jesus gets what he wants. So I'll say to you, Grace, since you are good shepherds. I don't say it because I think you're great. Although I do. I think you're fantastic. I think you're wonderful. 
I've had, a, I've had the privilege, outside of a handful of visitors here this morning, I've had the privilege of getting to know each and every one of you in deeper and deeper levels. You guys are phenomenal. You're giants in the faith. Every last one of you. I say it to your faces. That's not why I call you good shepherds today. I call you good shepherds because he has called you. He has called you good. Casey, you ready to run on it? John chapter 10, just as a re refresher. What does the Lord say? What does Jesus say? You're in good hands. I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He's already done this stuff, and he's already doing this stuff through you. So I encourage you, good shepherds, today. The hired hand, he's not about all that shepherding life. He does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks, and the flock scatters, and all the crazy stuff happens. The man runs away because he's a hired hand, and he cares nothing for the sheep. I'm the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, I lay, I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this pen. I must bring them also. That's you guys. Hey, surprise, for you came. Ah, just, isn't it fun to read prophetic language that, bah, 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 bah. that was you. Matter of fact, go ahead and take me over to uh, Romans, or we'll, we'll pop through real quick. Romans 11, maybe 9. Maybe 13. You're a good man. I'm talking to you Gentiles, Paul says. As much as I am the apostle to the Gentiles, I take pride in my ministry in the hope that I may somehow arise, <laughs> arouse my own people to envy. What? To jealousy. What? I want to make them so jealous for what God promised, for what the Messiah said was happening, that there are sheep not of this fold right now, you Jews. There are Gentiles coming in. And Paul is reiterating on that prophetic word that's going to go whoop. Whoosh, throughout eternity. There are other sheep that are coming in that I want to shepherd. And Paul's saying, I want these sheep. I want these sheep that God's heart is for, that he's magnifying his name through. I want them to be so loved, so powerful, so connected, that the, the Jewish people would look upon them and go, that has to be God because that used to be us. That used to be us whenever he would pour out his love, his mercy, his, ah. Oh. And they bear the mark of the king. They bear the mark of his people. He wants to make them so jealous for their rejection brought reconciliation to the world. What will their acceptance be but life from the dead? What happens? What happens when Gentiles, you and me, magnify Jesus so powerfully throughout this world that the Jews go, We want, he's the Messiah. Jesus is the Messiah. And what happens when the Jews stand with the Gentiles, with the Christians, as now born again Christian believers, little Christ ones? What happens when the Jews stand and together with one voice, all grafted into the tree, with one voice we say, Jesus is Lord. Let's care for his sheep. Pretty cool days. Pretty cool days. We'll, we'll leave the rest, my friend. We'll leave the rest. Whether God wants to use a carrot or whether he wants to use a stick, he wants to love his people. So let me put this in our terms. God wants to love this city. It's great that it happens to align with our heart. You know, our friends and family live here. Most of us, a lot of us, yes, most of us have a word. Everybody's from exactly. A lot of our friends and family live here. It's awesome. But he named this city. And he did so years ago. And he's been putting things in place for a long, long time. You, we, are a house of shepherds. Mine's just my family. That's all I see. Great. That's who his heart is for. Shepherd your husband, your wife, your kids. Well. 
Paul says, I just work and I just have this little job that I go to. I just, little old me, great. Everywhere you go, sooner or later you got to go to the grocery store, sooner or later you're going to hit the gas station, sooner or later you're going to see the same group of relationships over and over and over and over and over again. Guess who his heart is for? He's already said it. It's for the young. It's for the broken. It's for the maimed. It's for those who are hungering and thirsting. It's for those who can resonate whenever that spirit word comes into your heart and he says, go back over there and talk to that waitress. When she comes back by again, I want you to tell her something. Or I want you to leave a tip that would so bless her that it makes her ask a question. It makes her stop in her tracks. And when you see her again, bless her again. Be a people that are different so that whenever those questions start to emerge in their hearts, be the good shepherds, Grace Fellowship, of this city that point towards the good shepherd and say, I am broken, I am needy, I am, I am in need, I am in desperate, desperate need of the Holy One. And he fulfills and he sustains me daily, daily. Whenever I fall, he picks me back up and he says, left, right, let's go, let's go, Jared. You've gotten bogged down, anxiety and distraction, and you got a little discouraged there. That's my stuff. You got discouraged. Pay attention. Look at me. Look at me. Let's go. Amen? Amen. We can't do this, but he can. There's a word um, I'm going to share too much probably. You can correct me for it later. I'm looking at you. I'm looking at you, kid. Word Pastor David had, and the Lord's going to take it from me. That's good. Probably wasn't supposed to share that. I know you don't know. You got lucky. You got lucky. He just pulled that nugget right out of my head. Oh, I got to wrestle it back in. I got to let the Lord. I can just give it back. <laughs> don't call. Don't call unclean. What I call clean. Yes, it's in the word. Yeah. He was working with an individual that relentlessly made poor decisions and would constantly run back to the mud. Yeah. But God had done a work in her. And there was a time when he said, I just want to say, I'm done with you. You're gross and you stop it. And you're broken. He's never going to make it. And the Lord said, don't call unclean what I've called clean. Yeah. So I feel a little bit of a check there whenever I'm referring to Grace Fellowship Church. When I say, we can't do it, we cannot do it. But don't call unclean what I've called clean. When he says, shepherds, good shepherds, don't call. Let that not be in this house, the house of the Lord. In this place, he can make us whole. In this place, he makes us attractive to where people are drawn to him. That may be through your life. We recognize, can we, can we kind of commit together today, Grace? It ain't us. <laughs> okay. We can talk shorthand from this moment on. And in you. All right? We all got our stuff that we've gone through. And we're, you know, we understand we're pretty ugly and we got our junk. However, what he is called clean we won't be calling unclean anymore. Amen. So good shepherds, let's go before our king. Father, we love you. And we come now before the king of kings and lord of lords, King Jesus. And we ask you, King Jesus, to continue to set order in your home. So that this would be a place where you delight to dwell. That you want to magnify your name in such a way that God, you have what you've desired. Which is this city. Which is our hearts. Which are good shepherds. Thank you. We are honored that you chose here. We know that you're doing it around the world. We know, we know that we're not the only shepherds. That would be way too much of a job. It would be way too overwhelming. And you're a good shepherd. But God, you have chosen us. You have called us good. And for that, we're eternally grateful. Father, I pray that you would this week... You would return the words that you have spoken over each and every one of us. You would remind us of those eternal prophetic nuggets that you have placed in our lives. The ones that are true of us in the past, the ones that will be true of us in the future. God, just bring to remembrance those things in our lives this week. 
Remind us again, just like you reminded Pastor Dave yesterday, that there will be young men and there will be young women who come up that driveway seeking mentorship, seeking a spiritual father. And God, we got to see another iteration of that. We've seen young men and young women come out to that farm and walk up that driveway, drive up that driveway in search of a spiritual father and a mentor. And we've been grateful. And now they come in droves. Another wave that keeps growing and growing and growing. An eternal word from you, Almighty King. Remind us this week of what you have said, what you have spoken. We love you. We honor you. We praise you. It is in Jesus' name we pray. And all the people said? Amen. 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 Mingle.